Welcome everyone to the See the Trace webinar. So we're going to start in a couple of minutes. Uh, we just want to let a few more folks join and get settled in. Okay, thank you for joining for the See the Trace webinar. Uh, before we dive into the presentation, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have questions at any time uh, during this webinar, just use the Ask a Question tab located below the player, and then we're going to answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, go to the bottom of the page and click on Support for Viewers, and someone will help you. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, at the end of the webinar, please do take a moment to rate the presentation and provide feedback using the Rate This tab below your player. We will be posting a recorded version of this presentation, and it will be available at this same URL, so feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Okay. So this is our third in the Honeycomb Learn series, and we'll have two more in May and June. You can check out the previous series and register for the next series uh, at our Honeycomb website, honeycomb.io, under the Webinars tab. Okay, so I'm Molly Famous. I work in the Customer Success Organization. My background is in networking, operations, and data analytics. And I love working with customers. I work with customers every day, troubleshooting issues, solving problems. And I use Honeycomb every day to investigate issues on Honeycomb, as you can imagine. Uh, ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Ben Hartshorn. I am an engineer here at Honeycomb. My, opera, my background is also in ops, um, and uh, I, I really do believe in the, in the practice of DevOps. Um, I, I've spent a lot of my career running systems and uh, seen how difficult it is to, to really get good information out of these opaque applications that I, that I was supposed to run. And the, uh, the way that the industry is moving towards uh, sharing that responsibility so that the developers are also working on their systems in production, the, the operators are also building software in order to help do all that, it is making everything so much better. Um, so coming from that background of, of uh, more operating software than building it, I, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about instrumentation uh, and about how to understand the flow of, of traffic, and uh, that's, that's why I enjoy working with tracing quite so much. So I look forward to getting to talk about this a bit more with all of you. Good, good. Um, so today we'll be talking about distributed tracing, as Ben just said, uh, the benefits of it and how to use it within your organization. And we've worked very closely with our customers over the past few years developing these capabilities. And the information we're going to share with you today is based on uh, all of that experience. 
So Ben and I will talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll answer questions at the end. But feel free to type in your question at any time. So there are a number of different steps on the path to observability in your production systems. And we've already focused on instrumenting your code in episode one. So episode one was focused on how to better create telemetry so you can get context for the code, which helps everyone maintain a well-performing service. And then second in the series was how to run queries and conduct incident response, as well as how to proactively watch how production behaves, especially when there's new code deployed. So we covered how to configure triggers so that you can be proactive and get ahead of any problems uh, before they impact a variety, a wide variety of users. And I definitely encourage you to go back and listen to those two episodes and, and share them with your team members. But today, we're going to focus on distributed tracing. So we believe distributed tracing is a very important tool on the path to observability and to detect difficult to diagnose issues. Um, it is also very useful for watching how the system responds to new inputs. So whether that's a user who's very heavily using the system or new code that's been deployed, um, that's where tracing really shines. So let's dive into that. We at Honeycomb, we have a very holistic approach to managing production, and we firmly believe that the best approach for engineering, uh, for developing production systems, is for engineering, DevOps, and customer support to have the same tool so that we get complete visibility across all team members. Um, you know, I use Honeycomb every day to study and understand what's happening in, in a customer's environment uh, to help them diagnose issues and, and, and solve problems. So for us, observability, reaching an observability state really starts with development. So this little diagram here, basically what it's saying is we develop the code, we test it locally, we watch proactively what happens, we deploy it into production, validate that it's doing what we expect, fix issues as they come up, and then iterate, learn from that, and iterate over time. So we use Honeycomb for um, a variety of different things, feature development, solving difficult issues, uh, bugs, customer support, what I, what I work on, performance analytics, um, identifying performance problems, and then feature deployment con confirmation. And this dog, Coco, is our office dog, wonderful member of the team. Uh, she's still trying to figure out how to do incident response, but I can tell you that she delivers great emotional support while we're going through um, troubleshooting a tricky issue. So why trace? And then I'll tell you, it really, you know, it seems like lately tracing is really popular. A lot of people are interested in it. A lot of people are talking about it. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that you say it, it's come up in popularity recently. Um, tracing isn't really new. Uh, folks have been doing tracing for, for a very long time. Um, it's never been particularly easy. And I think the thing that's really uh, bringing it to the forefront now and why so many people, more people are talking about it and, and writing about it and developing around it is because uh, the industry has, has spent enough time understanding that it is valuable, uh, but it's too difficult. So, you know, people, everybody has been wanting, saying, you know, I, I want tracing, but, you know, it, it's, it's too much work. I'm not going to do it right now. Um, so the, the, uh, fact that a number of different uh, companies and open source projects and uh, working groups have been really focusing on uh, unifying the various uh, data models of tracing and providing better libraries and integrations uh, has allowed people to start using tracing uh, without spending months and months uh, going through everything uh, in order to, to um, get their code instrumented. So uh, yes, it has definitely uh, been rising in its, in its popularity and awareness. Um, but I think that that's really because 
it's getting so much easier to get in on it uh, and not because people are only now realizing how valuable it is. I see. Yeah, I, it's interesting. You know, I get a lot of questions um, from people who are interested in it but haven't yet started doing it, um, haven't started instrumenting their code. And I'm just curious, like in your experience with working with, with uh, all of our customers, do you, what are the, you know, why aren't more people, if it's easy to get started or easier to get started now, why aren't more people doing it? Uh, well, I think there's a, certainly a lot of leftover angst about that difficulty from the, the time before when it was really difficult. Um, and uh, it, we just we need to to keep uh, giving more examples and uh, having more people do it and realizing um, there there is a little bit of uh, extra lift at the beginning. Uh, I remember in the the instrumentation episode one, uh, Nathan was was talking about how uh, you know it it sometimes does take one person on a team uh, making that extra effort and spending some time to really get in there and build a scaffold. Uh, on which everyone else can can then improve and add extra data without uh, a lot of work. Um, it's it's a question of uh, just being able to get the ball rolling, I think. And uh, there's a lot of of uh, sort of leftover fear about so how much work it's going to be from from the times before. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, in our environment, we have a pretty complex service, uh, the architecture is, is, I would call it complex. Um, do you feel like you need to have a specific kind of architecture to get value from tracing? You know, that's interesting because uh, I, I think that that is another answer to your previous question too. Um, people think about tracing as only being relevant for enormous microservice architectures or distributed architectures, even if they're, they're not microservices. Uh, and uh, I haven't really used tracing as a tool so much when, when building monolithic services, thinking that, you know, I, I have what I need because everything's in this one process. But, um, I really believe that tracing excels in both environments. Uh, you, you don't need a distributed infrastructure in order to start using tracing because instrumenting even just a single service using the, the tracing paradigm can give you a fantastic view into the flow through, of execution through that service uh, in a way that, that's just very difficult to visualize with, with other instrumentation methods. And actually, um, uh, later on in this, we'll, we'll go through some examples. And uh, uh, the, the one example I'll, I'll start with is actually a single service. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about that then. Um, it, so it, it, it's not required to have a distributed infrastructure in order to start using tracing. But if you have a distributed infrastructure, tracing really is required. So it, it's it's like uh, uh, it can be easily applied in both environments, um, but it's very very difficult to get a good understanding of a distributed environment without something like tracing. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you've seen people instrument and and get started with tracing, um, do you? Do you see that they're trying to instrument everything at once, or what? What would you say is the most successful way to get started? I, I like that question uh, because it, it echoes uh, some of the fear around what it will take to get started with tracing. Um, in the old days, uh, it was that tracing is not valuable until you've instrumented everything, so that all of the pieces talking together are aware of the tracing. Uh, and that's just too much. That's not how anybody builds software any, uh, these days. You know, you hear the stories of, of the mythical and failed rewrites because somebody was like, you know, we, we, can't, we need to do it all at once. Um, that's definitely the, the wrong approach. Uh, the, the easiest way to get started with tracing is to put a shell around your service that starts the trace and makes sure it gets sent at the end. Even just that single step, uh, when a request comes into the service, start up a trace, set up the context so that other parts of your service can use it if they need to. They don't have to. So with that first shell enabled around even just one service, you start getting the, the bare bones of what will be a trace. Once that's there, mm -hmm. 
from within the service, you can then add spans and add context and add color and add little bits as you need them or as you identify uh, spots uh, in your service uh, that you need to see better. Um, and finally, even beyond that, uh, by adding a shell around one service and making sure that it emits the, the tracing uh, IDs and, and other bits of shared information as it calls other services, each team working on a given service or a uh, collection of services can then opt in and every one that you add adds value. But it's definitely not the case that you have to have them all before you get any value. Uh, that's definitely something that, that has put people off in the past. Um, and I, I definitely encourage people to just start with one and start with a single process, build your single process traces. As you need to add more, you do, and you gain value from that um, incremental value along the way. Okay. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, when maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how to read a trace view. All right. Yeah, let's talk about uh, uh, looking at traces. So the, the standard view into a trace is a waterfall diagram. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, the, the time axis goes across the top, and all of the different bits coming down the page are uh, individual spans. So um, let's go to uh, looking at uh, this waterfall a little bit more closely with a, with a couple of concepts. So when thinking of a trace, before we talk about how to, how to read this picture, I want to give you the, the um, bones that make a trace, a trace really different from, say, a single event. Um, a trace is a collection of spans. This is the vocabulary we're dealing with. A span represents a single unit of work, more or less. Um, and these spans are collected together in a tree structure. So uh, a span starts being called from a previous span. So that's a parent-child relationship. The parent span, when it needs to make a call that, that is instrumented, creates a child span to represent the work done in that uh, instrumented section. There's a special span that is the first one. It's called the root span. Um, it doesn't have to be actually super special. It's just saying that this is where the request came into this service, or this is where I started uh, this, this um, uh, job from, from the customer or from uh, a batch or whatever it is that gets triggered. Uh, the, the most common uh, features of a span are, first off, um, ident an identifier that joins it to the trace. That's the trace ID. You see that up at the top here. The trace ID is consistent across all spans. Within each span, there is a span ID that identifies that span specifically. Uh, if that span is a child of another span, it also includes the, the ID of its parent. So you'll see the span ID in a parent turn into the parent ID in that span's children. So the, the relationship is that one parent can have many children. Um, each child comes from a single parent. Um, the last bit about a span is that they have a duration. So they start at a specific time and they last for a certain amount of time. Uh, these are the, the main characteristics that are required in order to, to build up a trace. Um, I, there are I, a couple I, other, oh, go ahead, Molly. I, I have a question on this. If, if hmm. Um, I'm just curious. I've always thought that the root span, that top span, you know, it encapsulates the entire request, but this one gets cut off. Like it doesn't, it doesn't cover the entire request. You have these longer bars down at the bottom. What's happening there? Ah, that's a really interesting question. So um, you can think of spans as, uh, it, so if, if you think of a, um, uh, a job that needs to do a, a web request, uh, fulfilling a web page. Um, a client requests a page, the server collects all of the resources necessary to build that page, and then hands it back to the client, and its work is done. Right? So in that circumstance, uh, if the root span starts when it, the client request is received, um, all of the child spans are representing the work done, uh, that root span is finished when it hands back the final result to, um, to the client. In this example, uh, and this example is coming from our, uh, our UI, our web server, 
Um, the, the root span here is going long enough to hand back a result to the client. Now what this represents is uh, Honeycomb um, building a, uh, a result to hand back to the, to the customer. Um, but the way that we built our UI server uh, is that launching a query, when you, when you build a query in Honeycomb and you hit run query, um, that is actually launching an asynchronous request. So the round trip of uh, the, the web browser asking the server to please start running a query gets a response when the server says, great, I have started running your query. It, does, it doesn't wait until it says, I have finished running your query, here's the page. Uh, and this is sort of the, the model of um, uh, a lot of web services these days, that uh, the, the web page will issue small requests and get back responses quickly, even when those requests actually take a long time. So what we see in this visualization is that uh, when, the, when the server got this request to answer a query, there were a number of things it had to do before it could hand back a result, even saying, great, I have started your query. Uh, it authenticates the user. It builds an internal model of the query to validate it and make sure that it's a reasonable question, you know, checks that columns exist, um, you know, finds the, the identifiers for the database, finds the schema, makes sure that you know, builds up the query structure itself, hands it off to our backend storage engine. Um, when it has handed off that query to the storage engine and the storage engine has accepted it, that's when it responds to the client saying, great, your query is now in flight. That's when the root span ends. But the trace continues because the trace also is watching all of the stuff that's going on uh, from the, the storage engine and doesn't finish until that query itself actually finishes. So um, this, is, this is super valuable in that uh, you can see both when did the browser get a response back and how long did the actual query take uh, and then connect that back to the, the customer's uh, final result. So the, the thicker bar is down towards the bottom um, where it says, uh, you know, uh, execute query, retrieve a client, fetch, persist, S3 put, mark is done. Uh, the final span there, mark is done, that's when uh, it's, it's created an entry in the database saying this query is complete, uh, your results are available. Um, and the way that our, our UI does its polling, it's actually fetching those results uh, from where they're cached in S3 rather than handing them back to the browser live. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. It makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, the okay. last little bit of this page is the, uh, the field list on the right. Um, now, an interesting aspect of Honeycomb uh, we, we started as an eventing service where um, you, you could send in wide events with many fields filled with context, strings, numbers, um, objects, whatever you needed in order to understand what's going on within uh, the unit of work that that event represents. And the tracing view is no different. Every one of these spans is a complete event. Every one of them has a number of fields that describe uh, what's going on in that uh, in that span. Some of them are uh, relatively uninteresting, uh, like the instance type. Uh, definitely interesting when you're doing an instance type migration. Perhaps not so interesting uh, the rest of the time. That's an AWS instance type. That's where we run. Um, but user IDs, uh, all of these extra bits of information, the span is recording a unit of work. Um, a number of these are database queries. Those include the actual SQL query issued. Um, it's tremendously valuable to have every one of these spans annotated with a uh, large amount of extra context. Yes, I, I completely agree, especially um, like for me when I'm in support trying to figure out what's going on, the, the extra context is huge. Okay, so having just walked through the anatomy of a trace and, and how, um, how you would use it. We're going to cover a couple of trace use cases, tracing use cases. Um, there are many different ways you can use tracing, and the obvious one is incident response. It, Ben's going to walk through a, a real outage that we had, an incident that we had at Honeycomb, and show how, how we worked through that using tracing. Um, 
the other areas are whenever new code ships into production, so understanding how it's behaving, making sure it's doing what you think versus um, <laughs> unexpected behavior that could impact users. Um, and then in development, a lot of people don't think about using tracing um, and even observability in development, but it is so valuable because you can really see what's happening and understand that your system is behaving as you expect. So Ben, do you want to take us through the end-to-end -end incident you, you went through? Sure. Um, one more comment about, about this in development bit, um, especially relevant for the end-to-end the -end, uh, testing that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's really fun and interesting and exciting to be able to use the same instrumentation while you're building your service as you are going to have when you deploy that service to production. It gives you practice understanding what's normal, what's abnormal. It gives you uh, a, a mental model of what you're going to see when, you're, when it's really running in, in production so that you can uh, better uh, understand what you see when you're actually looking at that. And um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, of talk about uh, you know, automatically finding the, the parts that are interesting for you. Well, you know, people are, are really good at building mental models of things and then very, very quickly comparing their mental model against a piece of input. Uh, machines are, are not as good. Um, you can think of the, the dashboard that you see up on the wall in so many knocks and, and operation centers. Uh, everybody in that room has a deep, intimate understanding of what good looks like on that screen. And as you walk in the room, you glance up and know everything's good. Or, oh, that looks weird. Um, and part of building that is uh, using the same tool set as you're building the, the code as you will use when it's finally deployed. So that's, that's what I like best about using tracing in, in development, um, aside from the fact that it can actually correct your mental model from time to time. Uh, just uh, two <laughs> right. weeks ago, I was working on a service where I, I had uh, understood it, it's a, a batching service. So a piece of data comes in the door, and then it gets processed by the first section, and then goes through a channel to get processed by the second section, through a channel to get processed by the third section, and so on. And uh, I had a, a misunderstanding about which of those sections were serialized and which, was, which were going to run in parallel. And looking at a trace uh, just immediately broke that mental model and, and proved, uh, no, these ones are in parallel. You thought they were happening serially, but they're not. Uh, and that's incredibly valuable. Even though I was working in that code, um, uh, having the inter incorrect mental model of what it's doing is the easiest way to, to push in bugs. So that's my plug for using tracing and development. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, I think, not something I hear about so often, but I, I really enjoy it. Um, and with that, uh, on to incident response. So um, I, as we're running Honeycomb, um, we have a number of checks that uh, continually validate that our production service is working correctly. Uh, one of those sits outside our infrastructure's boundary uh, in order to simulate being an actual client of the service. Uh, so this is the spectrum of black box or gray box or white box testing, depending on how much the, the tester uh, the ETE check in this case knows about the service, um, but it's different from the type of instrumentation where uh, you're seeing what the server is doing, right? So this is looking at um, a client's perspective of how the service is working. This end-to-end -end check has a simple job. Um, it inserts an event through our API and then pulls via the UI to find out whether that event made it into the data set. If it successfully re retrieves the event that, it's, that it sent in, then it knows that the entire service from the API accepting it and parsing it, handing it off to the, uh, to the um, queue that uh, gets it ready for the storage engine to writing it to disk on the storage server. Um, and on the other side, the reading section that our UI is working, that uh, it is able to query the storage engine, that storage engine is able to respond to that query. All of that, that entire process is validated by this end-to-end -end check. And now, because it does such a uh, comprehensive job of checking everything, um, it's a, a very high signal alert. Um, when, something, when the end-to-end -end check reports that something is going wrong, we jump. 
this is one of the few things we have that will page somebody in the middle of the night uh, because it, it is so complete in its, in its check, right? If, uh, it doesn't matter which service is broken. If a customer is unable to get back the data that they put in, our service is broken and we need to do something about it. So that's what we're looking at. Um, uh, Molly, does that, all that make sense? Uh, that's a, uh, anything to add on the description of what the end-to-end -end service does? No, I thought that was phenomenal. Great. Okay, so um, I want to start by uh, showing what normal looks like. Um, this is a uh, uh, visualization of the end-to-end -end check running successfully. Um, and there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time unpacking what we're looking at. Uh, now, the, uh, the, the reality of our storage engine is that it is sharded. Um, our customer data comes in the front door and lands on uh, one of many shards in the background. This is how we, we grow and scale and, and keep everything fast while uh, accepting both small and, and large volumes of data. Um, so this is one aspect that the end-to-end -end check actually knows a little bit more about the implementation of the service than one of our customers. In order to verify that not just the service is working in general, but that every single one of the backend shards is working, the end-to-end -end check has a special configuration, a, a different data set, each of which is pinned to a specific shard, and it submits an event to every one of those data sets and checks that it got every one of them back. And that's how it verifies that all of the shards uh, supporting our service are functioning correctly. And now there's a question that came in earlier about concurrent child spans. And this is a really good visualization of how that looks. The end-to-end -end check runs all of these uh, probes in parallel. So it submits all, uh, all of the probes to all of the shards at once and uh, then has a separate Go routine. We use Go for most of our services. A separate Go routine that uh, watches the success of the submission and then pulls to uh, try and get that data back. And the way that that uh, concurrency is visualized, uh, on the left of the screen, you see what we call the bus stop diagram. Uh, the main bar, vertical bar, indicates the, uh, the connection back to the root span. And each of these stops on that bar represents one of those go routines. And each of those go routines has a whole subtrace flowing out from below it. Um, and you can see that uh, the, there are three visible on the screen right now three Go routines uh, running in parallel. The first was the quickest. The second took a little bit longer. The third is the longest. All three of them succeeded eventually, um, but they, they took different amounts of time to, to finish. Uh, and one of the characteristics of the way that this check works, uh, when the end-to-end -end test client uh, requests the, um, the data that it inserted back, uh, it's supposed to get back the 10 most recent probes and it examines them and includes data from uh, the three previous samples as part of the uh, metadata attached to this span. Um, so this is what uh, I expect the trace to look like. They are variable length. Um, they all generally succeed after a couple of checks. Uh, the voc vocabulary here is that a probe uh, is the go routine that's, that's checking a data set. It submits a probe, and then it later on checks the probe. The check probe span uh, has a number of check probe once spans underneath it. Each of the check probe once spans checks a single time. The check probe span is running that in a loop with a maximum and a timeout and, and other guards against it running forever. Okay, so this is normal. This is what good stuff looks like. Uh, when we got an alert, uh, instead it looked like this. So what we're seeing are an enormous number of check probe once spans. Uh, and the interesting part here is that the sample's length is zero. Now, every time that uh, that check probe was supposed to go in, uh, it, it was supposed to get back 10 results. Now, if it didn't find its probe in those 10 results, uh, great, it would say, I failed, and then um, it would try again a little bit later. This time, it's getting none back, and so all of them are failing. That's, that's pretty clear. Now, the interesting part about looking at this as a trace Normal, with normal uh, sort of metrics-based instrumentation, we might record how long the check probe thing took. We might record how many iterations it included. Um, and that's about it. What we would see is that uh, these checks were failing. They were taking uh, 
uh, 50 seconds, which we know is the, the maximum that they're allowed to run before they report it, an overall failure. Um, and that's about it. Uh, we'd have to really start digging in order to find out what's going wrong. By using tracing to instrument this client and have it include such detailed data in every span, not only uh, what was uh, how long did it take to make this request, but what was the status code it got back? How many results did it get back? What were some of those sample results? Um, we, we immediately see what's going on here. There's almost no digging necessary. If we understand, if we're getting zero results back, clearly the query to get those 10 results is, is failing. Uh, we immediately know where to look to start, to, to look at this code. But there's one more question that we haven't, uh, we haven't answered. Um, and I'm going to switch over to an actual Honeycomb uh, uh, screen share here because I'm afraid I don't have a slide for this. Um, so give me just one moment while I pull that up. This is going to be the same, uh, the same window we were just looking at, um, but this one, is, this one is live. So this is the same trace we were looking at before. Um, and uh, we've selected the same one. We see samples length is zero here. My question is now, okay, um, is, is that representative of just this one trace? Or is that actually the problem that, that we're looking at? Now, I got into this trace. Um, I, I didn't show you how we got into this trace. But uh, when, the, when the issue was happening, this is the, the query that we were looking at. Um, this is a, a regular honeycomb query, not a, not a trace view, but just a regular query saying, uh, show me all of the successes and failures for probes in production. So the filter is on and environment is production, the name is probe, and we can see there's this rough, rough patch in here. The, the number of successful probes is dramatically reduced. So we clicked through to one of them, got to this trace, looked at the span, saw, hey, samples length is zero. That's really weird. Also, uh, that the last three values are missing. Well, I mean, that makes sense because we didn't get any values left. But is this actually representative of that same span of time? So here I'm issuing a honeycomb query. Uh, that is now restricted to the check probe once and shows me what are the samples lengths that I get back. Here in the table down below, we can see uh, we got 10, uh, 10 samples back on failed attempts. We got 10 samples back on true attempts. We got zero samples back as this green line. That time range is exactly the same. That's confirmation that the individual trace I was looking at is actually representative of the entire span of that outage. And that's what can give me confidence that I'm not chasing a, a rabbit hole. I'm not going down some strange thing that was just happened that once in that one trace without going back and you know just spot checking traces. There are a lot of traces that are included in this window. Um, but the ability for Honeycomb to take the deep view of a trace, this is what exactly one request going through the system looked like, and spin it back into, OK, let me take something I learned there and look at it broadly across all of the traffic that's coming in. Uh, and then go back and forth. That's the, uh, uh, what, what uh, we sometimes talk about, the, the core analysis loop, um, building hypotheses, looking at them, backing up, uh, and seeing the same problem from, from very different perspectives. Um, that's where tracing as one view into the problem uh, really lets us speed up that, uh, that loop. Okay, Molly, I, I've run way longer than I, I meant to. Um, I want to hand it back to you. That was awesome. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking about that. Um, I, I really do enjoy uh, uh, incident analysis because of my background in, in operations, but also tracing. And I, I, yeah, it's, it was a really fun problem yeah. to, to work through. Um, turned out it I was love... actually a, a, pushed, a bit of pushed code that had uh, broken just that one endpoint and, and didn't represent a, a full outage, but um, full you know, outage, that happens yeah. too. Yeah. I love how articulate you are about it. Um, well, okay, so now we're going to speed up a little bit. <laughs> um, go back to the slides. Um, so a very interesting walkthrough of a real-world situation. Um, new code shipping is another area that, that tracing can be very valuable in. Um, I, in customer support, do use tracing. We recently shipped a triggers enhancement. Triggers are how we alert in our system, and we shipped an enhancement to our users 
um, that would time out long running queries. And I used traces to watch the runs of the trigger service and validate that we weren't seeing clusters of timeouts or anomalous number of timeouts um, to make sure that the feature was working as expected. Um, so with that, I'm going to give a quick demo. So Ben already showed you some live honeycomb. I have some demo data that I'm just going to run through just to give you a flavor of how you move in and out of a trace and leverage um, the insight that honeycomb can give you. So I am also going to share my screen. Give me a second. While she's setting oh. that up, uh, thank you for the questions that came in. Um, uh, please let us know if, if uh, the, the question about child spans and current child spans is not answered fully. I can talk about that more at the end. Ah, you got your screen up. Great. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what we're seeing here, this is the main query interface of Honeycomb. We're looking at um, endpoint calls. Uh, we have an API, so we're looking at the endpoint calls. And of course, you see this very large spike um, uh, at the end. And we're filtered just to errors that are happening in the endpoint. Um, so the first thing to do is to ask, okay, well, what's happening here? Um, one way we can start to explore this is to start with the traces tab. So I have my query with my data. And then what we provide you in the traces tab is a list of the top 10 um, traces that have the longest duration. So this spike in API calls is actually increasing latency in our service. And this is giving me the top traces that show that latency. We also give you a span summary that's very handy because it allows you to see at a glance if any of the traces are anomalous. For example, I threw this one in. This one looks very different than the others. Um, and so you might start there. Um, for this demo, though, I want to look at long query runtime. So I'm just going to pick one of the traces that has one of those long runtimes. Ben walked a little bit through the trace. So you can see each span and its nested position in the waterfall graph. We can see the start of the trace, which is that API call, and the duration with that high latency. Um, this trace, basically, the request came in. We checked rate limits. We then fetched some user info, did some authentication, and then started our fetch to the back end. Uh, one thing I see right away is that all of these queries are running sequentially, which is probably part of why, why it's taking so long. They really should be running, um, running uh, parallel. Um, but I also have access to all of the context within each span. It's not aggregated away. And so I can see, for example, what, what host it was running on, what the customer, who the customer was, what build ID this, this particular request used. Uh, it's very powerful. And in this demo data, I only have, I don't know, maybe 50 spans. But in uh, our customers' traces, most of our customers have traces that are in the thousands of spans and for some even 100,000 spans. And Finding information in the trace when you have that many spans is very challenging. And so we have some uh, enhancements that will help you navigate through this trace and get to your answer sooner. So first of all, collapsing and expanding spans. You need to get, I want to need to see all the spans that are of this type, expand them all so I can see them, or collapse everything at the second level of depth. So getting very quickly um, to see what's important. And furthermore, you can then search all of the spans to figure out and find important information. So for example, I might be interested in searching the spans for which ones contain the word error. And the only one I get is this fetch tickets for export. I can look over here and see, ah, the error it has is deadline expired. So these queries ran for too long. I can also look at for a particular query, what the query was, and say, is this, this you know, are all my 
query spans running this query? And I can see, yes, they are. They're all matching. So that's some nice ways to really get at the details of the, of the trace and find information quickly, especially when you have thousands of spans like most of our, our customers do. And then finally, we're looking at one trace, and this is what Ben talked a little bit about. We're looking at one trace, and that's really useful. It's one request. I can study one request. But here's the thing. A lot of times you want to know, is that indicative of a bigger problem? You want to zoom out. So we're at a very granular level here. Now you want to zoom out. And Honeycomb also gives you the ability to do that. Um, so one thing I can do is like, is this limited to a particular user? I can specify breakdown by this field, user ID, and Honeycomb is going to rerun the query, splitting all the calls up into which users made those calls. We call it breakdown. So I can say breakdown by field, and right here we can see in fact, it's just one user responsible for this increase in the number of requests and the increasing latency, so I can reach out to that user. But I've looked at very close detail of the request and then zoomed out to that global view to get my answer. And that's, and that's one, of the, one of the really nice benefits of Honeycomb. I didn't have to go to another tool or anything like that. I could just answer my questions, follow my line of thought, to get to the right answer. I think you're really hitting something important there, Molly. Um, that when understanding what your production service is doing, there are many different types of questions you're going to ask. And each of those questions has different ways to best represent the data in order to answer it. If you're looking very deep, uh, the waterfall is great. If you're looking very wide, understanding the relationships between those fields and, and their values uh, is, is a, a far better way of, of looking at what's going on. Um, so the, the tracing is important, um, but I really like how, how you've touched on that it's, it's just one of the views that you're going to use as you're exploring what your production service is doing. Right, right. So I want to get to questions. So just very quickly, um, what did we cover today? Well, we talked about the importance of tracing and how valuable it is to get context. Um, there are many use cases besides incident response. I, act, I just so encourage you to try it while you're developing. I do that. I find it very useful, um, as well as watching how new features behave in production. Um, and that it's very powerful to switch back and forth between this global view or, or you know, um, a more aggregate view versus just looking at one single trace. And you don't have to boil the ocean. Start slow. Instrument one trace, just as Ben said, get started there. You'd be shocked at how just instrumenting one thing can even get other people on your team excited, and then they start instrumenting as well. It it's, it's becomes kind of a, a viral spread. Um, so with that, let's go to some questions. Um, okay, we've, we've got a few showing up. Um, uh, please continue to ask them. Uh, we have... I think uh, about 12 minutes left, so I'd love to spend some, some time uh, focusing on what you would like to hear. Um, the, Molly, you want to take, the, uh, take one of them first? Shall I jump sure. In? Yeah, I can um, limit on, we are getting a question, is there a limit on the number of traces you can handle or manage? The answer is no. Um, so we have a, a um, incredibly high throughput ingest pipeline, so we can handle lots of events coming in. Um, and then our storage engine, you know, it's parallel, parallelly scaled and all of that. To, uh, and so there is not the problem. I think, Ben, if you were to think, are there any problems you could think of that would happen if you had a large number of traces? I assume the question is about traces and not spans, which are the individual bars inside the trace. Yeah. Well, Honeycomb's model uh, is that um, uh, events or spans come in and are, are stored in a data set, uh, and that data set has a capacity uh, that um, is part of our, our pricing structure. So. The, uh, the, the trade-off between storage and, um, and the amount of 
time that represents, uh, it basically is a function of the throughput. So if you send an enormous number of traces in uh, and have a small retention, a small uh, data set, uh, then you will have tracing data for a small amount of time. Um, a large volume going into a large data set, you will have a longer uh, amount of time it represents. Um, but none of the, none of the uh, steps along the way are actually specific to traces. Um, Honeycomb's model was built on these complex events, and a trace is really a collection of events that have a unifying identifier, uh, a field, a trace ID. Uh, and that trace ID field is a field just like any other in Honeycomb. So um, the, the limits, uh, there really is no limit on the number of traces uh, independent from the amount of uh, storage it takes to retain those traces on disk and then uh, the amount of time that represents for um, uh, the size of that data set. Does that make sense? That, that makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> I think that's um, a good answer. Another, another question. Um, there are, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of fields uh, in, in my events I'm sending in. Does, will that cause the traces to take a long time to generate? Um, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, the number of fields present on events is independent from uh, what it takes to, to generate a trace. So uh, thinking about the, the uh, trace IDs and the parent IDs and so on, um, in order to build that waterfall representation, you really need uh, four fields, the span ID, the parent ID, the trace ID, and the timestamp, uh, five fields, and the duration. Um, Honeycomb's query engine is optimized for selecting a few number of fields that are present across a, a group of events. So all of the rest of the fields that are part of that data, which is great, highly contextual data is the best kind of data, um, they don't influence the amount of time necessary to build that, that, uh, that waterfall. Uh, once it's built, uh, you can see all of the rest of the, the fields uh, on the side. And um, uh, in terms of, of performance, um, uh, they're, all, they're all very, very fast to put together. Uh, the next question coming in is about instrumenting traces. What's the best way to do that for Honeycomb? Um, so uh, there, are, there are a couple of ways. Um, we have our, our own SDKs. Uh, the libhoney is, is our raw SDK, and the B-lines are the Honeycomb uh, SDKs that are tracing enabled. So they have traces as first-class concepts within the SDK. They have things like start span, uh, finish span, um, uh, so that's, that's the one that, uh, that we've written to, to really help people get started when they are getting started with, with Honeycomb. Uh, we do have some compatibility with other uh, uh, tracing SDKs. Um, specifically, if you use the open tracing uh, Zipkin SDKs or, or Jaeger SDKs configured in, uh, to use the Zipkin wire format, we can accept those. Uh, we have some exporters for open census. So, um, uh, it's important to, to play well with others uh, in terms of accepting both other, uh, other SDKs as well as other tracing formats. Although uh, we have found, at least in our customer base, um, there's a, a big value in concentrating tracing uh, to a single standard across uh, um, a, an organization. So I had spoken before about um, not trying to do everything at once. Uh, but it is good to at least choose one standard to use across an organization so that as uh, you continue to instrument additional pieces, uh, they, can, they can play well together. Um, so the short answer, the best way to do instrumentation for Honeycomb, use a beeline. Uh, do we support open standards too? Yes, we absolutely do. Molly, you got something to add? Um, no, I just, uh, I was just gonna comment that, that we have the beelines which do auto instrumentation and that's very very useful to getting started even if you don't decide you don't want to do it that way in the long term um it allows you to get started running traces in like a few minutes versus uh days and days mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good point i didn't talk about the automatic instrumentation part um but more that the the beelines have a, a native tracing api uh what an interesting part of, of uh, the work instrumenting is deciding what should be instrumented. 
Uh, and this is one thing that, that people love about um, some of the, the bigger APM products uh, is that they just like magically choose it for you. Um, but uh, they, a lot of them also have a, uh, well, I'm not going to get into that part now. Um, the beelines do some automatic instrumentation. So uh, for example, if you use the, the wrapper that uh, is aware that you're running an HTTP server, it will automatically add things like the client IP address and whether you had a load balancer that was forwarded and um, the HTTP status code on the way back. And you know, all of the things that are relevant for HTTP will be automatically instrumented uh, if you use the HTTP wrappers in the beeline. Um, so the, the beeline is both the tracing API and, and that automatic stuff. Yeah, Molly. You, you've got a really interesting question here coming in. Oh, yes, okay. So the question is, um, I would like to use a service mesh, specifically Envoy, to instrument our microservices. Is that supported? Um, and what are the advantages and disadvantages to using a service mesh versus uh, instrumenting in your code? So this is a, a question with a couple of parts, uh, and we've got five minutes, so I, I will do my best, but um, please forgive me if we need to cut off the bits. Uh, yes, uh, service meshes are great. Um, uh, Envoy can emit uh, uh, events in the Zipkin wire format, which Honeycomb can ingest. So you're good on that part. Um, it is supported by Honeycomb. Um, advantages and disadvantages to using meshes versus code instrumentation, uh, or the third option, why not both? There are, uh, so understanding the relationship between services is a key part of tracing. This can be handled either by the mesh or by the, the code itself. So when a service is calling out to a dependent service, let's say, you know, I need to authenticate a user, I'm going to call out to the authentication service. Well, my code definitely knows that. So uh, I can create a span in code that says I'm calling the auth service. Um, the mesh also knows that. So it can identify that uh, you know, the, the um, application handler has made a call to the auth service. Um, where the mesh falls down is that it doesn't have any facility to augment those spans with additional information that's relevant to the service. So as a service is... Uh, is trying to complete its job. Um, some of its calls out to third-party services are straightforward, ask a question, get fired. Um, others are a little bit more subtle. It might check a cache first and then call the database, uh, or it might um, check a couple of backends and uh, uh, combine those results in some interesting way. All of that interesting stuff that the service is doing is not visible to the mesh. So adding instrumentation about the actual behavior of the service itself from within the code of that service is incredibly valuable. That is the real benefit of doing instrumentation from within a service. Uh, getting instrumentation from the mesh is valuable because it relieves some of the, uh, the, the duties of each different service maintainer. The mesh can see all of that traffic going back and forth between all of the services without uh, the, the need of each service maintainer to adding instrumentation within it. So there are definitely benefits to both. Um, you can do both and combine that data uh, to get both the, the mesh's view of um, which services are being called as well as additional spans from within each service, uh, augmenting that trace with extra data. Uh, there's one challenge in that the mesh sees calls between services. If that service making a call out to another service has passed through the trace propagation from the, uh, the, the person that called it, and it includes that in a way that the mesh can see it, well, th that is the only case in which the mesh can actually combine the, the, uh, the different calls into a trace that can then be included with the application. So, it actually does require some work on the application service authors per, uh, uh, side in order to allow the mesh to build this complete trace. Otherwise, all it sees is, you know, there were 50 requests that came into application service, and there were 30 requests that went between application service and auth service. Uh, but being able to tie those back together without that identifier that, that needs to be threaded through is very difficult. So, okay, um, <laughs> I hope that answers the question. It is complicated, uh, but uh, both is definitely a good choice um, with, with caveats. Uh, and we're running and out of we time. Can, 
Yeah, we can follow up, um, certainly follow up with additional questions. Just send them into support at honeycomb.io. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, we have a number of additional resources provided here. Please join our next episode where we'll talk about outlier analysis. Very useful. Um, Bye-bye. Thanks, and please give feedback. <laughs> please give feedback. Um, let us know what you thought of the session, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Have a great day or night, depending on your time zone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>